Five seconds. Okay, so I think we're on. I might have had some some connection glitches. Uh, so good morning uh, or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, Stockholm time afternoon session. Uh, uh, for me, it's the morning. Um, uh, in the uh, Joint AI and Music Creativity Conference. Uh, I'm Shlomo Dubnov and uh, I'm happy to uh, chair uh, the super interesting session. Uh, all of the papers uh, focused on uh, various applications of uh, deep learning um, towards uh, music creativity computer uh, uh, computer assisted music orchestration uh, other kind of karaoke uh, generating drum loops uh, and uh, inter interactive uh, generating interactively with human in the loop for melody creation um, and uh, also auto tagging for loop based music so this is really a variety of uh, aspects that we deal with when we have to create music and uh, we'll see how the deep neural networks uh, can assist us in doing this so um uh, our first speaker uh, is carmine manuel sella i hope i pronounced the name right and uh, i will uh, pass uh well pass the microphone virtually to you uh, please go on on Slack for questions, and uh, I will try kind of to moderate the questions and answers. And um, thank you. Good morning to everybody. It is morning for me too. Uh, I am in California now at CNMAT, the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies of the University of California, Berkeley. Um, this place has a long tradition in uh, uh, research for musical application and, and, and the, the kind of uh, expression uh, machine creativity is always at the center of our work. So we, <coughs> we, uh, uh, we have several topics uh, this, uh, in this moment you know, uh, in, in the research agenda. And one of them is uh, um, related to the talk that I'm giving today <coughs> that is about uh, com com uh, assisted composition techniques or when the computers can help composers uh, and musicians to make music basically uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very specific way. Uh, the uh, specific subtopic uh, that I will be focusing on today is uh, so-called assisted orchestration. Uh, so uh, this topic is uh, a, a long-standing problem for composers since uh, several years. Uh, and uh, IRCAM, uh, the Research Institute in Paris, uh, has, has been somehow the leader in, in the development of these of this research. And I've been at IRCAM for a number of years, and now I'm, I'm in Berkeley. So uh, um, I'm working on this idea of uh, using computers to help composers in uh, orchestrating uh, since a number of years now. Um, 
So at, at CNMAT, we develop uh, jointly with IRCAM and HOM, what they call the music engineer, uh, a, a software called Orchidea, orchestration idea, if you wish. That is uh, so, so somehow uh, uh, the state of the art system for assisted orchestration. Uh, and so in this context, uh, uh, we, uh, we have students working on, on some sort of evolutions of this approach or, or, or this problem. And this is the, the topic of this, of this uh, paper today. So uh, let me open my slides so that I can actually share some information with you. Uh, here we go. So uh, this paper has been done in a, in a, uh, in, in a context in which we, we, uh, we bring undergraduate students in, in, the, in the research agenda at CNMAT and, and they have a sort of internship for a number of months and then the, the outcomes uh, are oftentimes a paper or just a software, uh, depending on the case. In this case, uh, the three students are Luke Dvonchik, uh, Alejandro Saldariaga Fuertes and Ong Fu Liu and have been super supervised by me. Uh, my name is Carmen Cella. I am an assistant professor in music and technology uh, here. And Ellen Camille Crayenkur, that is a, a researcher in, 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 in Paris. Uh, so the idea of this work was, uh, so since there is a state-of-the-art system called Orchidea that does orchestration, uh, but this system uh, only marginally uses uh, neural networks for orchestration. So the idea was, can we think about a hand-to-hand -hand system that could do orchestration uh, completely, like, you know, giving files and, giving, and getting the orchestration at the end? Um, so this, this is somehow the, the beginning of this kind of research for us. Um, and uh, we have, we have uh, partial results at the moment, uh, but I think it was inter interesting to see uh, the potential of these you know, uh, technologies for the topic of assisted orchestration. So before uh, describing the approach that we uh, developed in this paper, I'd like to give an overview about the problem itself. So what is computer assisted orchestration? Well, uh, in a word, is in a word is a sort of uh, searching for combinations of orchestral instruments or sounds that match uh, a target sound. So basically, you have a sound that can be whatever, like a recording, uh, a bell toll, or you know, a train, uh, uh, or uh, you know, a speaking voice, any kind of um, sound, physical recording of of a sound. Uh, so you want to approximate this sound by putting together a number of samples from a database of orchestral instruments uh, so that when they play together, they sound similar or more close, uh, perceptually speaking, to the target sound. That's the kind of the, the, uh, the, the general idea behind assisted orchestration. In other words, you want to reproduce a physical sound by using instruments, physical instruments. Uh, in the context of, of uh, spectral music or spectralism, this idea is called usually instrumental synthesis. So we do synthesis using musical instruments. And as, as you can see here in this image, uh, uh, basically a solution to this problem is a, is a score, right? So is a score in which you select a number of instruments, a number of notes, uh, dynamics, and playing styles. For example, here we see a clarinet playing an E4 in pianissimo, ordinario, and then a trumpet playing a B flat 5 in mezzo forte, staccato, and so on. So we have uh, a number of samples that uh, play together, should play, uh, should sound, let's say, as the target sound. Again, the outcome of assisted orchestration is not a sound, it's a score. So it's a symbolic uh, outcome, right? But the input is physical, is a target sound. So is a, a recording or a raw samples, if you wish. So indeed, one, interest, one interesting aspect of this of these software or of this problem in general is uh, the fact that you go from the low level of sounds to the high level, somehow abstract level of, symbol, of score, like uh, uh, symbolic, symbolic level. Uh, this is um, an interesting problem, and this is actually a, a, a long-standing problem for composers. Uh, today, uh, given the uh, extended techniques that composer use, composers use for, for uh, music uh, writing, when I say composers here, I, I specifically mean um, uh, these kind of composers that work within the, uh, the umbrella of contemporary classical music, right? So avant-garde music, if you wish, this is a bad expression, I don't like it, but you know, in principle, uh, this is just um, a way to say that this is embedded in the, in, in the classical tradition. It's not like pop music or pop composers or jazz composers, it more, it's more classical contemporary composers. Um, in the, in, the, in, in the recent years, uh, I don't know, 50 years or so, uh, uh, instrumental techniques developed very much. Uh, and so the composers tried to uh, add new way to play, new, new ways to play instruments. 
and eventually uh, uh, they ended up with a, a complexity that was kind of very difficult to handle by hand, right? So you, you would need some sort of computational support in order to drive your intuition and to help your uh, uh, imagination because, you know, imagining uh, together very different sounds made by very different playing styles uh, and, 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 and figure out the timbre would be very difficult. That's why uh, these kind of tools developed. So <clears throat> let me review uh, very quickly, very quickly, which is the, the classic approach in, in, in solving this problem. Uh, so uh, the, the problem is made by a number of steps. Uh, some of these steps are used today neural networks, uh, namely the optimization phase that you see on the right, um, uh, on the right uh, of this, of this uh, image. But the general idea is that you have a, 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 a dynamic sound, like a, I don't know, a speaking voice, for example. Then you perform some sort of segmentation of this sound by any kind of novelty measure. So basically, you look for a new chunk of sound that is, you know, uh, interesting for orchestration. Then. For each segment, what you do is just you do an optimization. So actually, orchestration can be thought of as a combinatorial optimization problem. I, I, I'll explain why in a second. So this optimization that we have today is a two-step optimization in which we have a sort of pursuit strategy for pre-optimizing the, the, the situation, uh, I would say the combinatorial space. And then uh, we have a, a, an evolutionary approach uh, for uh, finding the solutions. When I say evolutionary, I mean that it, it takes inspiration, inspiration from biology. So we have something that is very close to genetic algorithms. Um, and this was a, 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 one of the first solutions to this problem and then is still uh, one of the best solution for the problem. And then, uh, so these uh, algorithm generates a number of solutions in time. And then there is a sort of connection algorithm that creates some sort of voicing or connection over time of this solution. We can think about that as a, a sort of points in a graph and you want to find a, a closed path in the graph, so to speak. Uh, so um, let me explain why this problem is actually a combinational, uh, combinatorial problem. So suppose you have a, a single orchestra of two instruments. For example, you have a clarinet and a trumpet. And suppose that is, each instrument can play just two notes. Okay, then uh, to find the best combinations of these instruments to match a target sound, you would just compute all the possible combinations, like one note of the clarinet, the other note of the, the trumpet, and then the second note of the clarinet, the second note of the trumpet, and so on. But this becomes very difficult to, uh, to, to deal with if you have more notes, like we have, for, for example, 40 notes for the trumpet and 40 notes for the clarinet on several different you know, uh, uh, dynamic levels, for example, pianissimo, piano, forte, 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 fortissimo, and eventually different playing styles, staccato, legato, uh, and so on. And so, and then what happens if you put into this game all the, or the instruments in the orchestra, like all the strings or, or, the, or the winds or the brasses? So the combinations become too many. So you cannot actually compute them uh, physically uh, with brute force and, and then evaluate each combination to see how close this combination is with the target. So you need to find a heuristics that is able to uh, actually navigate this combinatorial space in a smart way, if you wish. That's what we do with this double, uh, uh, double uh, uh, stepped uh, uh, algorithm in which we have a pre-optimization phase using matching pursuit, a variant of matching pursuit, and then uh, 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 evolutionary optimization. So this was somehow the, uh, this is somehow the state of the art uh, of, of uh, this solution. Now, uh, of course, in these in these algorithm that you see, or, or I would say in this kind of, of uh, workflow, we see a number of steps. And as I was mentioning, only one of these steps is done by neural networks. It is uh, somehow the representational steps of the combination that happens in this box here during the optimization. So during the optimization, we use a neural network to compute the features of the combinations. And in fact, we don't compute the features. We just predict the features because for some reasons we cannot really compute all the combinations. It would take too much time uh, during the, the search. So we use a sort of a forecast of the features using an neural network. But the idea behind the paper was, can we actually uh, use a paper, sorry, use a neural network to do all the job, to make a sort of end-to-end -end approach? Again, uh, this was not meant to uh, uh, being the state of the art or being doing better than, than the state of the art. It was just a, a first, you know, uh, trial if you wish to see what to, to which to which uh, point we can uh, we can go using neural network so the idea uh, behind this uh, method is very very simple so you have a target sound as we had before and then we train a neural network as a classifier but we want what do we want to classify so we want to classify at the same time the instrument 
that you find into this sound, the note and the dynamic level. So in other words, suppose that you, you train a classifier by inputting a, a, a sum of three sounds like clarinet, E4, piano, and trumpet, B5, whatever, forte, or, and so on. So you have real instruments with real notes and, 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 and the labels. So, so you know which kind of uh, uh, symbolic elements you have in these sounds. Then you train the network to retrieve this, this information. Okay, so this is the training phase. And then the, uh, the idea of the testing is instead of uh, testing on a real combination of instruments like clarinet, piano, and, 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 and flute, we put, we inject into the network any kind of sounds, like for example, a recording of, of a, a bell tone. And we want to see what the network predicts for this kind of sound. So, in, in, so the idea was if we train correctly the network as a classifier and the network is able to classify notes, instruments, and, pro, and dynamics, then if we input a sound that is not uh, made by this kind of components, the network nonetheless will predict these uh, components for the, target, for the input sound. So this is somehow how we go from classification to orchestration. The general idea uh, is, uh, I was saying, uh, very simple. So we have uh, a sort of a probability function at the end of the network, and we use uh, uh, so the, the peaks of this probability functions correspond to the instrument. So we we find we classifying we classify jointly the instrument and and the note, and then we use the probability level uh, if to retrieve the dynamics of the sound. So if the sample is more probable, then probably it is uh, uh, more loud. That was the, the assumption at, at the beginning. Um, so um, so the, the outcome of this network is indeed a score as it was in, in, the, in, in, in Orchidea. And we tested two major ar architecture uh, for, uh, for this uh, classification problem. Uh, so we tested uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, design, specifically designed network made by a uh, convolutional neural network with an LSTM uh, kernel at the, uh, in the middle. And then we used a uh, ResNet, so the residual network uh, that has uh, found uh, excellent results for classification for images, for example. So we trained these two different models and uh, we uh, ended up having nice results for classification. So these networks were able to classify correctly uh, instruments and nodes jointly and using uh, the, the, the probabilities for the dynamics. So we basically had, <coughs> uh, um, uh, so the, the first step of our research was to understand how good was the classification. And indeed, uh, we had you know, uh, 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 quite good classification results. That was, of, of course, depending on the number of instruments. So in, if the combination of instruments was made by, for example, two instruments, well, the results were very good. But of course, if you went to up to 10 instruments, then the classification results uh, dropped uh, a little bit. Uh, but still with, for example, with ResNet, uh, we still had like 75% of ac accuracy in classifying 10 different instruments in the combination. So it was uh, good enough for, for us to try for the classification. Uh, and so we made a number of experiments and indeed uh, the, uh, the best results were, were always uh, made by ResNet, but the CNN uh, somehow uh, did interesting results too. Uh, uh, so we have uh, uh, a number of samples in, in, in uh, online that you can actually check. Uh, uh, so let me let me see if I can quickly switch to the other screen. Uh, I'd like to stop share, sharing my screen. Yes, here. So I think my time is finished, uh, but uh, let me just quickly go through uh, this page here. Uh, so if you want to play uh, these samples, uh, there is uh, uh, this, this page here in which you have target sounds uh, like, you know, a bassoon, the solutions provided by Archidea and the solution by our system. And so you can play, I don't know, uh, for example, uh, this sound here. And then the solution generated by Archidea. So uh, to conclude, the system is not uh, still uh, complete, but it was uh, first a first trial and we, we see promising results for the future. Thanks so much for your attention. Okay. So uh, I will uh, ask some questions. Thank you so much for Thank you. wonderful presentation. Uh, 
my quick uh, maybe first uh, thought uh, is this in some sense continuation of the spectral music Joao Grise a motivation so uh, yeah in, in a sense uh, the cultural context is uh, spectralism so it, it is a tool that you know uh, uh, found its way within this context this cultural context so uh, in, 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 a, in a specific kind of music which for example you use uh, insp you take inspiration from sound analysis right so uh, I think about pieces like partiel by Grise which you know was using the sound of a trombone to generate spectra and to derive compositional parameters uh, this uh, uh, was done, you know, by hand. Basically, you took the sound and you you analyzed the, you know, the, the parcels for the sound and the amplitudes, and you would derive some sort of compositional, you know, uh, information. Like, for example, the notes or, or or the dynamics. So, automating this process would really help this kind of mindset. Like, if you work in this kind of uh, in this kind of you know uh, music, then these tools could be very valuable. Nonetheless, uh, I have uh, so behind our there is a community of users, and there are very very di diverse profiles. So. There are, there are composers that don't really belong to this kind of music, and they use Orchidea nonetheless for other kind of you know purposes. So, uh, I, I, actually, to me, um, um, it was interesting to see how, how how different could be the usages of your of your tools uh, when you put these tools into the hands of artists that they do very different things. Uh, so, this tool has been used for, for example, uh, sound sound uh, soundtracks uh, building. For example, you would record a natural soundscape and you would reorchestrate with your Orchidea, and so in that case, the outcome would not be the the score but would be the the sound that orchidea generates because by the way orchidea not only generates the score but it also generates uh, the sound so i think yes in in, in short uh, speckle is, is is at the root of this project but this project you know shows very different uh, application on, uh, nonetheless so we have uh, one more related uh, question uh, by gabriel uh William Sony. um so he says thank you for the presentation uh, yes, Carmine, uh, we have two part questions. Um, do you, don't you think the process implemented by Orchidea will also work in non avant garde musical context as well? And the second part of the question is Are there any specific characteristics in so called avant garde music that inform the design or condition the tasks in Orchidea? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, so I think f to the first question I already answered, of course, uh, you can use this software in very different styles of music. There is nothing specific to avant-garde music in Orchidea. Uh, um, as I was saying, uh, many other composers that, for example, do uh, music for movies, they, they use Orchidea too. So it, it's totally uh, depending on, 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 your, on your needs, actually. And by the way, there is no connection to spectralism or avant-garde music in, in the system itself. So the system is, to some extent, agnostic to the style. The decisions are only made on timbre, basically. And so we can use these. So you, you should think about Orchidea as a system to approximate a given timbre using instrument, musical instruments. So uh, as long as your problem fits this kind of uh, definition, I think you can use uh, Orchidea without problems. Um, so there is nothing specifically uh, related to style in Orchidea. There will be, uh, because I'm working on a, on a specific variant of this system, which we input style as a parameter of the orchestration. But you know, the basic system, the system that will always be uh, developed is uh, basically agnostic. So you can use it in any kind of uh, musical style, if you wish. So I think uh, we have uh, a couple, we have a little bit more time, a couple more questions. So Odette Vental is asking, what would be the advantage of using deep learning for these tasks that Orchidea cannot achieve? Uh, so uh, the problem is that uh, this uh, approach has been developed during several years, and the, this kind of handcrafted approach uh, proved to be very effective for orchestration. But nonetheless, there are problems that are very complicated. For example, um, and so we uh, basically the idea would be let's see if we can use neural networks in some part of this project. So one would be uh, to design an end to end network, but the other one would be to see if this end to end network would provide some useful representations, for example, for the task of assisted orchestration. Um, in, 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 let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, when you start adding the idea of style, musical styling in orchestration, so in, instead of using just the timbre as the target of your orchestration, you would target, uh, you would use, you would use timbre and and style, I suppose. 
then it means that the database or the data set would exponentially increase in size because you need to add uh, uh, several elements that encode somehow the style, not only the timbre of your, of your orchestration. And then uh, methods that are not, uh, uh, that, that, so working with very large databases is an issue for many, many optimization methods. So uh, these upscale or these, you know, uh, uh, capability of going towards larger scales of the problems is intrinsic in neural networks. So I think neural networks could be a valuable um, technology to uh, improve the uh, optimization phase. That said, I'm not uh, completely uh, uh, sold on neural networks works today, so I'm, I'm, I'm researching, but I think that we should uh, embed neural networks in a larger context that is always uh, uh, motivated by or our knowledge or our needs. So um, this was an approach just to develop some tools, for example, to see how convolutional neural networks could actually uh, represent sounds for acid orchestration, and we learned something, but still I think that the, 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 the long is pretty long, the, the road is pretty long, sorry. Um. So I think we maybe have one more minute. Let me check if there's any other question. Um, you know, uh, one one technical clarification. No, yeah, question and but so you're matching spectral profiles, uh, I guess. Uh, are we sure that uh, some phase in information or spectral flux? I mean, are there other dimensions than the spectrum that maybe just are missing from the representation? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a good question. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, this was a simplification again, because uh, in the real uh, uh, algorithm that we have, uh, the one that uses uh, uh, evolution optimization, we use some some uh, we use time in a specific way. So um, segmentation is done using, for example, spectral flux. One of the ways to do that is using spectral flux. So we keep time into the loop of the optimization. This was not the case for neural networks. And so the optimization was done uh, basically on, on either uh, spectra or MFCCs, for example. Uh, and so you lose a lot of information. That's totally true. Uh, but this was kind of a first uh, you know, attempt to see if nonetheless we could have something. And then the idea, so the, one of these students uh, is Luke, will probably continue this work in this semester uh, to try to add time back into this architecture and to see how we can shape a network in order to deal with time. And so that's why actually we started thinking about, you know, LSTMs machines or memory related machines to see what we can do with time and spectra. Okay, thank you so much. I think we are um, yeah, one, one minute over time. So uh, I guess cool. whoever has more questions on the Slack channel, uh, we'll be moving to the next, uh, next talk. Thank you. Uh, we have a paper by, yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, I got a already moved on to uh, present the next um, next speakers. Uh, uh, so the next paper is by Sophie uh, Iditskaya, Sophia San, and Derek Kwan. Uh, uh, the title is Karaoke of Dream, a multimodal neural network generated music experience. I think we uh, the presenters here would be Sophia and, um, and Derek, right? Uh, we have both of you, so uh, you'll be switching between the presentations. And for those on Slack, uh, uh, since we go by, I think, the first order, so the Slack will be under, I think, Yuditskaya. Uh, so please, um, yeah, I would like to welcome you and please have the stage. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Dobnov. Let me share my screen. Present. Awesome. Um, so we'll be talking about karaoke dreams. This is probably a more um, whimsical uh, to uh, paper among <laughs> the rest. Um, so, oh, there we go. Um, We'll be first giving an introduction and showing a video demo, and then we'll talk about the neural network generated content creation part, and then the system implementing the, the generation and using it as an artwork. So Karaoke of Dreams um, is a site-specific art project that we made in in one of our in, in our art residence at Bombay Beach, California. As you can see, it's 
located in the Californian desert. Um, it has amazing sunsets. We have a site where um, Bombay Beach, California is a town that is semi-deserted but reinvigorated by artists in recent years. And there are a lot of crazy stuff going on in the town. Uh, our project is sort of a, a homage to, to this town and the city and this community of artists um, to say, yeah. Uh, this is our karaoke, the, the little box over here in among other um, art projects in one of our showcase nights earlier this year. So this is the context of Karaoke of Dreams. Um, we wanted to use Neural Network to see if we can inject a little bit of techness in, in this vast land of, of nothingness. Derek. Cool. Uh, so we three were together um, in this uh, residency at Bombay Beach. It called uh, Brahman.ai. Um, now it's gonna, in the future, it's gonna be known as Mars College and it's uh, led by um, uh, machine Gene learning. Kogan. Uh, yeah, machine learning uh, artist extraordinaire, uh, Gene Kogan. So uh, like a bunch of artists and technologists were together in the middle of the desert. And of course we wanted to come up with like some projects to work on. And we came ac across uh, the common ground of uh, karaoke. And so why karaoke? Um, it's like uh, from the paper we cited, cited uh, by Mitsui and Hosokawa. It's a performance of intimacy, right? Um, it's very communal. You're sharing like, like potentially embarrassing experiences with each other. And it's like a very bonding sort of thing. Um, it's enabled by technology. Uh, like, I guess you could do it without technology. Like if you have like the lyrics and something to like play music, play the music, but uh, I guess like well, we all know that it's like a video screen with like lyrics going across the screen and um, singing along. So us being uh, artists and technologists, it seemed like a very natural thing to pick. And it's also a form of entertainment. Um, like uh, it's like a time for us to like really let our guard down and like en enjoy like each other's company and and um, like as like I'm a musician and like Sophia is uh, like uh, studying machine learning, so it's like a like a natural uh, project that we could work on together, like uh, joining a. Uh, machine machine learning and uh, music yeah so, we're yeah. interested in, in it because it's one of the most prominent form of machine human collaboration in some sense and then it's it's done for a non-productive goal it's it's an interesting form where where we can perform cyborg art together in some sense yes okay let me share a video of the demo um so the system, how it presents to people is in, there are, this is Sophie. Let me know if you can hear me. Uh, you, I don't think you shared the, the audio. Uh, ah, okay. Um, this is, this would be difficult, but let me show you the video first. So this is, um, So if uh, if you want to reshare the screen and share share audio, there's the, the small oh. button on the left when you share a screen in 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 Zoom. Uh, if you want to try that, I think it would be can you can, can you repeat? Experience. Oh yeah, uh, if you go back to the share screen, yes. Uh, and when you click on this, you will have on the left a, a little checkbox it says share uh, share computer sound. I don't think I see it. Yes, but it's okay. We can move on. Um, uh, the The video link is on um, on the paper. So feel free to. We have a demo. This is the system right here. Um, the person sees an iPad, mm -hmm. which gives them the 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 lyrics. And then um, in the start of the um, the demo, we have the interface, a recording, screen recording of the interface. 
where they prompt the lyrics too, and then you can hear the music too. Um, but okay. yes, uh, coming back so, to the cover. Yes, please. So, so you know, you just exited the share screen. So oh, if, oh, dang! I'm <laughs> so sorry. No, it's fine. So if you go back, check again. I mean, you should see this small button on the left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On the left. Uh, um, I don't okay. think no, I do. Right. Yeah. Green. Let's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you. So this is this is this is the interface where you where you see the lyrics coming on the top, and then um, when it's presented, it's in it's mounted on like a smaller hypercube, as we uh, say it, in the karaoke. And then um, the videos that are generated in in the karaoke, in the sense, is projected onto the the karaoke. Um, as atmospheric lightning, uh, lighting, and for people to view from the outside. Um, so this is the feeling of it. In in some sense, you have you have the outside world, but you also have the inside world, and they're both visible to the viewer and to the singer at the same time. Cool. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, moving on to content generation. Great. Um, so, so there are three parts in the karaoke in some sense, um, the lyrics, the music, the visuals, and we want all of them to be neurogenerated in some sense, because at Bombay Beach, we only had one GPU and it's a shared resource with everybody and we want to be, and it's powered by solar power. So we wanted it to, to be resource conscious. So instead of training models from scratch, we looked at downloadable on the shelf neural network um, uh, train models, and then we used it in in a modular way to so we can swap in and out models as if we want to improve in the future or have newer versions. The lyrics are very straightforward. It's it's a GPT two fine tuned on pop song lyrics data sets available on the internet. Here is an example. Um, we had community uh, members of com um, of the local community to give us uh, song titles just to just as a primer of the on-site art. So the the list of songs people choose from are a list of songs people demanded from us in some sense. And this is a quote from from a local homeless person. Um, and the song is in memory of him. Uh, he's an innocent man. Great. Um, and the music generation is is um, through a GAN based music model called MuseGAN. It's trained on the Lock Piano Roll dataset, uh, the Almighty. And then what it does is it's a convolutionary neural network that generates four bar piano rolls. This is a unfixed, uncleaned um, sort of example of what it's like. One of the one of one of the bars in a four bar chunk but as you can see it has five tracks and it is it was trained on pop songs it has some of the pop um, qualities to it once you hear um, our demo and then so the chunks are mapped to the lyrics lines generated in the previous ones um, randomly for 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 visuals the the video present uh, projected onto the karaoke. Um, we use the intention again, which which takes in a caption and then tries to generate the image that fits the caption. Um, as we can see, it's very abstract because a lot of our lyrics are abstract, but it, it has this dreamlike qualities that fits to the karaoke concept. And then after um, generating the image images, we use a, a algorithm to have tr have them transform from one to another. Um, it's a, a video is generated for each song and projected onto the karaoke. Yeah. Now Derek talks about the system. Cool, uh, awesome. Uh, uh, can we move next slide? Cool. So. Uh... It's a picture of um, our installation in the desert and within a uh, Sophie Yudetskaya's uh, uh, Tesseract made by two by fours. And basically it's uh, an iPad as a user interface, a Raspberry Pi 3B plus with uh, the four speakers depicted as um, 
like the audio engine and the, the server and a laptop with running VDMX, which is like a video um, performance software uh, and a projector for the visuals. Um, and that was uh, Sophie Yudiskaya the generated, uh, took care of the visuals. So we can move on to the next slide. Cool. Uh, so, so basically, um, the system software was a user interface, uh, a, web a web page using React, uh, web socket communication with the server, which is um, Node.js web server, which is run on Raspberry Pi. Uh, it hosted the website for the iPad, uh, which is um, uh, the iPad connected to the, to the Raspberry Pi via uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi connection. Basically, the server's job was to uh, load the lyrics um, requested by the client line by line, um, and also communicate with the audio engine, which was uh, Pure Data, which is this uh, open source visual programming software specifically for audio. If um, you're familiar with Max, this is uh, the same creator, but um, uh, you later created open source version. It's called Pure Data, and so Pure Data. Um, was in charge of uh, loading MIDI files, which was um, outputted and uh, sonifying it using um, synthesizers. And it's basically responsible for all timing information, uh, deciding the tempo, telling the when to uh, load, to, to send uh, lyric lines uh, for Node.js. So if you can go to the next slide. Cool. Uh, so basically uh, the user interface I tried to make it as simple as possible so it didn't have to deal with logic at all. Um, so it basically populated the list of songs. Uh, like I had like an array of like the list of songs in uh, React. And uh, React basically took care of like all the dynamic aspects of um, the interface. So they had the song select screen as shown in that left picture and the lyric display dis displayed in that right, right hand side picture. And basically, it showed the lyrics one hand, one line at a time, uh, as specified by Node. And uh, since uh, sometimes we have repeated lines, I changed the background color um, of that little box so I can tell when you had a new line. And uh, if we can move on to the next slide, we had a so basically this web page was hosted hosted uh, in Node. Basically, uh, I used the Express. Uh, framework and uh, and basically uh, it communicated with um, uh, the iPad via web sockets and uh, PD via open sound control OSC and basically uh, the, the iPad uh, the user picks a song on the iPad which sends like an uh, index um, of the song uh, which is like uh, all all the songs have like a there's like a common order between PD uh, Node and the iPad, so I could just tell them part by index, and so the, the iPad sent an index to Node, which in turn loaded the lyric file and told PD which uh, MIDI file to load, and so uh, PD uh, basically uh, tells Node to like send lyrics line by line via OSC. And as mentioned earlier, um, basically Node is handling all the logic between like switching the between the different screens because I wanted to make the iPad as simple as possible. Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide. Um, basically, uh, PD loaded the audio. Um, Loaded the MIDI, it sonified it with synths, uh, frequency modulation synths, and drum synths, and basically took care of timing information. If we can move on to the next slide, um, basically, um, when the when the PD loaded a file, uh, it randomized a bunch of parameters like uh, parameters of the synths and the tempo, and basically the whole idea was to uh, make this um, make each performance as unique as possible. So we, so I can turn it over to Sophia now. She, she can conclude. <laughs> yes. Um, in the paper, we, we talked to a bunch of people who have used our system. And the feedback is was 
that because you and the machine need to collaborate, um, when the machine prompts you with music, you need to come up with the top line um, for the lyrics and the melody. Um, it's an interesting experience similar to machine human collaboration. Um, and then you need to trust the machine. It, it, it fosters this, and, and you are in this atmospherically lighted box, which feels like the inside of the machine too. Um, it has this strange feeling and that's sort of the vibe we're going for. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the four the four testimonies are also in our paper. They're fun to read. Um, yeah, yeah. And also there are a lot of things that we can do and can go forward with it. First of all, um, a lot have changed since March, I guess, in, in the machine learning space. GPT-3 is out. And then OpenAI has a very cool new model for music generation, which directly um, generates audio. It's called Jukesbox. Um, Magenta project also has a bunch of interesting models that we could use. So the music part can al always be separated out. Um, we're also thinking of having a web hosted version of it. So the user can just input a, a song title and then everything would be handled by the server. We can, we can do karaoke of dreams via the internet. Um, yeah, and we're thinking, also thinking about other on-site constructions. What would it be like in a city? What would it be like in a town in different parts of the world? Um, also, our reviewers suggested we could do a more thorough UI UX study of the system and study the behavior of how trust works and how collab musical collaboration works between the user and the machine. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Derek and, and uh, Sogam. Uh, we didn't have right now questions on Slack. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we can check this later again. Uh, for the sake of timekeeping, I think uh, we'll kind of move on. Uh, I would just say that this was very impressive and, and uh, finding yourself in the desert with so much technology, it's uh, almost like uh, Elon Musk sending to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the images of the desert and the, and the California sky with your installation, I think for me, just, just my, uh, my personal impression was wonderful. I'm looking forward to check the sounds. Um, thank you. Uh, so our next speaker, uh, Guillaume Allen, um, is going uh, to present the paper on Deep Drummer, generating drum loops using deep learning and human in the loop. So, Guillaume, please. Uh, yeah. It says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Start my video. Can you see me? Yeah, I, I can see you. But, Great. Uh, and I can and see your screen. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Who's that? Yeah. All right. Sure. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Guillaume Alain, and I am going to be presenting our paper called Deep Drummer Generating Drum Loops Using Deep Learning and Human in the Loop. So, this is work by um, us four at MILA, the Quebec Institute of Learning Algorithms, um, aka Joshua Bengio's lab. Um, um, on the top row here, um, there's myself and my co-first author, Maxim. And um, in a way, we, we started this project with the intention of writing something that composes electronic music, but we ended up in a different place. And um, part of the inspiration um, for our project was some paper that I read 10 years ago. And I like that paper a lot. It, it was based on the insight that it's usually easier to tell whether you like something than to actually guess what the parameters behind that thing are. And the example that they were giving was the example of a 3D engine in which some artist was trying to get the particular type of smoke or flame effects that they had in mind, but they just couldn't really say what 
the parameters for like air viscosity, gravity, a number of particles, like what are those parameters that will get you the right kind of smoke effects? But if you see the smoke, you can tell this is what I want. And so they had this system that was doing active learning. So querying your user to make sure that, um, to, 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 to ask the user if what they're getting is what they want. And they were using Gaussian processes underneath. So what I liked about this is, is this dynamics of the system asking the user to rate something because rating something is much easier than generating something. And so this in a way goes in a different direction than the popular paradigm about generating music as a sequence of tokens or events or notes. Like there's, there's this um, very successful approach of treating music as an NLP problem. And you, you build a model that, that generates tokens, you learn on a big training set of sequences of tokens, and then you put a very powerful neural network on it, which is represented here by the dinosaur. And, and uh, the idea is you have a lot of layers, a lot of neuron, large capacity, you train for a long time, and then you've got this powerful sequence modeling. So this is not what we're doing. And there's this GAN approach, which also involves two powerful pieces interacting. You've got the generator that tries to generate uh, fake content that's meant to come from the training data set. And you've got the discriminator, which is also a big neural network, which has a lot of layers, a lot of capacity. You need to train it. Training it is hard. You've got this dynamics. They don't want to do the same thing. They fight, but at the end, you get a system that can generate samples that seem to come out of your training set if, if things work. But what we thought about doing was not that. So we thought about exploring a different idea. Like what if we had something that we wanted to call a weak generator for lack of a better word. So just a bunch of random patterns. And then what if, um, what if we had infinite human patients and we were willing to sit there and the weak generator would generate like a million samples, uh, a million loops or melodies or whatever it is. And then we painstakingly rate every one of those. And then at the end, we found like 10 things out of the million that sounds all right. Then we bring that to somebody else and, and say, voila, our system crafted those 10, 10 jewels. Like, is that something that we really wanted to do? Like, no, but in like, technically it sort of works assuming they're willing to, to have infinite patience. So what if instead we could have a neural network that's being the critic? The neural network is going to try to learn what we like and what we don't like. And it's going to filter out like the vast majority of the garbage that comes out of the generator um, is going to be filtered by that. And then it's going to give us only the things that it thinks we will like. And uh, so in a way it tries to imitate us. It serves as a proxy for us. And what is special about this case is that contrary to a situation where it would have to, to basically have ratings for all the search space, it, it, it's going to propose something that it thinks we will like. And we're going to say, no, we don't like this. And then it's going to go back to the drawing board and then try to generate something else that we will learn, uh, something else that we will like. And so in a way, the labeling that's occurring is on the most relevant examples instead of um, garbage examples that it knows we, we don't like. So it doesn't have an incentive to spend time labeling the bad stuff. It only wants to label the good stuff and it gets a lot of it wrong, but some of it right. So that's, that's the idea that we wanted to try out. And for the sake of um, not being overly ambitious, like we, we, we started doing this with drum patterns, hence the idea of naming this deep drummer. So we are studying 16 step patterns of, of, of drums, which, are, which have four, four instruments and by instruments, I mean like one shot samples so snares, kick, kick drums and all that. And um, in our setup, like we did not want to label instruments specifically. So we picked about like 300 one shot samples. We threw them all in a big bucket without saying this is a kick, this is a snare. And Deep Drummer just pulls from that and generates segments. 
and then it will try to learn our preferences for the generated content. And so it goes a bit like this. Deep Drummer says, hey, this drop blue X one is something you like. And they say, yeah, we like it. Just add this to your training set. And it generates something else. Hey, this, loop, this drum loop X2 is something you like. And we say, no, 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 this is bad. You remember that we don't like that, please. And then eventually, by training a lot more, it can be a good proxy for us, one would hope. Now, there's a difficulty right off the bat here. And this is why I was suspicious that, about this approach first. I thought that this wouldn't work because deep learning requires a lot of data. Like, if if our users rate like 80 drum loops each, say, that means that you get 80 bits to train a deep neural network. And that's stupid. Like deep learning is supposed to run on a lot of data. Even MNIST, like the most basic thing has like 50,000 training examples. So is it really possible? But we implemented a prototype of it and uh, we definitely, like, my colleague and I both had the feeling that it was working. And this was the contradiction. Like, it didn't seem like it was supposed to work, but it felt like it did. And so we wanted to investigate further. Like, and, and we, th we thought maybe it's because of the active learning aspect of it that it works. We don't know, but it's worth an experiment. So the hypothesis is that if we, if, if we do this interaction with a user starting from nothing, at the end of the interactivity, after 80 ratings, the drum loops generated are going to be better than they were at the beginning and significantly better. And so how do we build an experiment to test this? And uh, just as a reminder, the setup that we're using to generate those candidate drum loops, drum loops is that we have this, 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 um, random patterns, we have one-shot samples, and we render that as an audio waveform. We feed that in a neural network, which has some MFCC features, convolutions, and then we output the predicted probability that the user will like that. And um, yeah, so the experimental protocol has to be split into two phases. And I'll explain a bit why we need to do that. So. Phase number one is where the active learning aspect is taking place. So we are going to ask questions to the user. Do you like this? Do you like that? And then after each response from the user, we're going to retrain our model. And then at the end, we think that we're going to have something better. Now, we can't just track what the percentage of drum loops being liked is, because then we might suffer from shifting user preferences, like what if a user at the beginning has a tendency to dislike things more just because they're in a good mood or I don't know, they're, they're in a bad mood. And then at the end, for some reason they feel tired. So they, they just start clicking like or dislike and we remove the connection between the quality and the rating. So in order to fight this, we have a phase two. So we do phase one for 10 minutes, we have a short break, and then we do phase two. And in phase two, we're going to present them with drum loops, like new, new drum loops, either from the very first model or for the very last model. And, and um, it's, it's going to ask for ratings. The user doesn't know if it's coming from the first model or from the last model. And then based on the ratios of of drum loops that it likes, we're going to conclude whether the first model is better, uh, no, the last model is better than the first model. And if it is, we're happy about it because then it's no longer just a feeling, it's actually something measured. So because of COVID, we, have to, we had to run this experiment online. We set up a web, a web server. We issued a call to participation at Mila. At the end, we got 25 participants. So this does not include us. We got some more participants uh, to be used to debug the pro prototype, but they're not part of that. And uh, we wanted to keep the experiment short to avoid basically driving people insane. Because what we realized was that after rating drum loops for 20 minutes, um, something weird happens to your brain and you start losing track of reality and what you like and what you don't like. So we wanted to be gentle to our users and we, we wanted to find the sweet spot where we'd find some tangible benefit, but we weren't taxing the users too much. And uh, I'm going to show you quickly just a short demo of what the interactions look like, and I'm going to go to the results after. 
So my colleague here is running through some ratings. So that's the first drum loop. She dislikes it. Anyway, so that goes on for 80 ratings, and I'm going to show you now after, like close to, to the end, what it sounds like. So it sounds better than at the beginning. Also, she aggressively clicks like or dislike. You don't need to listen to the whole thing. Uh, but if you do want, the interface is going to play each drum loop four times and add one more second at the end for, for, for the sound to fade out. And uh, oops, I'm going to show you some of my, some of the drum loops that I like. That was one I liked and this one I saw. And we can ask the system to generate something bad also. Actually, that, that, that was a random bad occurrence, not a purposefully bad. Pur purposefully bad ones are even worse. OK, so results now. So um, as I was saying, we are keeping track of what percentage of drum loops users have rated as good and as bad at the beginning and at the end. Now I'm talking about results in phase two, where the users doesn't know, uh, don't know which model the loops co are coming from. So they couldn't cheat to favor the final model, even if they wanted to. And uh, on the x-axis, you've got the basically the percentage of times that they like things, and uh, on the on the y-axis is the number of users in that bin. So initially, uh, for the initial model, we've got a lot more people. Um, closer to zero. And for the final model, we've got more users closer to one. So this suggests that there's an improvement. And uh, funny enough, we've got one user out of 25 who liked nothing. They clicked dislike on every single thing. I think they had some expectation about what it was supposed to sound like, and they were let down. But hey, that's one person out of 25. And I'm going to also talk about the deltas here because uh, like this is the per user difference. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? And uh, the big mass of, of um, users is clearly in the positive. And so that means there's a bunch of people who like things at, at the end, like 40% more. And by 40% more, I, I meant maybe at the beginning, they like 20% and at the end they like 60%. And there are some people who like things a bit, who are a bit disappointed at it, but most people have saw some improvement. And if we actually do the counts, we had 72% that saw some improvement, and we had 36% that saw an improvement bigger than 0.2. So that's nice. And just to be like um, more formal about it, we ran a Wilcoxon's uh, uh, test that confirms that the final ratios are bigger than the initial ratios with a P value of, 0 0.00013. So we were happy about that. And we have our code online. We also have the drum loops that we generated during this experiment available. And we have a little demo on YouTube. Thanks again. OK. Thank you, Guillaume, so much, and uh, all the others for a fascinating paper and work. Um, a couple of questions. So. Uh, Bob Storm is asking, have you thought about asking participants to rate generated examples with respect to some well-defined characteristics, like four on the floor, instead of rate by whether you like it or not? Well, we did try to enforce, I mean, as, as um, j j just, just for fun, we did try to restrict the search space at some point to four on the floor. But the problem is, um, it felt like the drum loops were more plausible, but they felt less inspired. It felt more mechanical. And, uh, and uh, in a way, by not enforcing that constraint, we were happy when we found out that sometimes uh, the drum loops that we generated ended up having a four on the 
folklore kind of flavor because that means that there's a rhythmic aspect that that was learned. However, we did not ask the users specifically to watch out for a certain thing. Um, we did ask in, in some exit survey um, if they felt that um, it that the system had learned something. And we also had an open question asking them, so what did you generally use as a criterion? And this was just like, tell us a few words about how you made your pick. But we didn't really tell them what to look for. We weren't really sure what to tell them to look for, to be honest. I see. Uh, and one, one more question uh, by Gabriel uh, Viglinsoni. I hope I pronounced last name correctly. Um, so Gabriel is asking, uh, it's interesting you are combining rhythmic pattern generation and sound selection in one step. Uh, do you think uh, an easier task would be to split the task in two? Uh, that is choosing specific drum patterns and then choosing specific sounds for those patterns. Yes, um, we debated a lot about what the structure of this should be. And in a way, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reasons behind the experiment that we ran that was about maintaining some kind of simplicity in that um, at some point, because one of the things that you can do with such a system is you could technically seed it with music that you already like. Like you could dump like a gig in there of positive examples and say, I already like that. And, 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 and then the system could learn from that, but from your input too. But then if you're running a system with 25 users, then how are you supposed to ask people to bring the music they like and dump this into there? So, but as, as for disentangling the rhythm and the sound, um, that could have been something else. Like, like that's, that's a slightly different project if we're asking like, uh, um, like having a classifier about which sound our users like um, was something that we could have done, but we didn't do that. And at some point, one of the, one of the questions that we asked ourselves was, I mean, the, 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 the biggest criticism about our paper that we formulated to ourselves, like we were thinking about that, is are the users, I mean, is the system just learning what kind of sounds the users like? And then by producing drum loops with those sounds, users like them more. And, and this is what we're measuring. And the response to that is uh, there's definitely a rhythmic element to the sounds that come out at the end, which isn't there at the beginning. And so it can't just be the sounds. So it is doing both at, at the same time, but we are not really disentangling them. And this, mm -hmm. this in a way is, is a bit of the like machine, uh, the deep learning approach of you do all the steps at the same time. And if good stuff comes out, you're happy about it. But yes, there's definitely uh, something to be said about disentangling those two factors. I see. Um, so there is uh, some interesting ongoing discussion uh, about uh, on the Slack about uh, several people saying that they like the bad beats. So I'll try to summarize maybe the questions also for the sake of, uh, of keeping well, the time. Well, uh, okay. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm, I, I, I'm okay. I am not seeing the Slack at their current time, so I don't know what's no, being no, no, said. No, so I, but, <laughs> okay, but 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 if you like the bad beats, mm -hmm. then that just means that that Deep Drummer is going to learn those quote unquote bad beats for you. Like right. the the things I like don't really match what my colleague likes. Like sometimes I listen to the stuff that she clicked on, and I said mm, I don't like that, and that's fine. And, and, and that's, that's part of the experiment. And, and so it is going to go in the direction where you want it to. And if you're looking for something with like cowbells or, or uh, novel ideas or I don't know, maybe it will go there instead of doing some boring pop music uh, tried and true thing. I don't know. Right. But um, if you like the bad stuff, it just it means it's not bad. It's, it's just a different thing than what I was rating for. And that's fine. Right. No, no, of course, <laughs> I was kind of trying to summarize the questions uh, of, of several people in, into one. But I think uh, when the, the sense that I understand from this question was uh, really asking if the system is uh, uh, learning a preference or whether the user is getting tired in, in the groove. In, in, well, in the, the, um, um, 
it, it, we, we really try to, to, to learn a preference, but the thing about whether the user is getting tired, like the, uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the reason why we had phase two, and in phase two, we sort of randomly showed samples from the first model and the last one is because we decorrelate the fact that the user is getting tired with the ratings that that they give now um i mean there's still a way for the user to to in a way start like if the user were tired and they really latched on a certain type of pattern and they click like for that and dislike for all the rest then in a way it's a bit hard for us to disentangle do they like something because they're tired or do they like something because they really like it but what we certainly did is that in phase two, they, they cannot, um, I mean, the ratings for things at the end are not correlated with the timing. So that means that, that we're, we're not simply measuring that at the beginning they click like a lot and at the end they click, they click dislike more or the opposite. Mm -hmm. No, th yeah, thank you for clarifying. I think the, the question was also, the uh, considering uh, the other way, maybe the user gets adapted to the system, the user gets in the groove. So oh, oh, oh also, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it yes. Be both ways, he gets tired yeah. or he gets uh, excited. <laughs> right. Well, well, when he tried it first, I mean, my first experience doing this for the first time was a bit disorienting. Like, I thought, what am I rating for? And I clicked and I said, wait, do I like this? Do I no longer like this? And I felt like I needed to be coherent with myself and, and, and to rate the same things. And and, and there is definitely some shift that happened in my mind the first time I did it. And, and, and then afterwards, after I did this for 10 times, because you can bet that we ran through this thing individually each like 20 times to debug all the settings and all that. And at the end, like I knew what I was looking for. And, uh, and so the, the dynamics was a bit different and we had to put ourselves in the mindset of the first time that we ran through this experiment and yes they might get into the groove but um then in phase two we're still going to compare patterns from the first model versus patterns from the last model and if our users are in the groove maybe they'll rate both a bit higher than they would have but we're really looking for the delta between init and last so if they both go up the delta is still the same hopefully okay uh so the, there are more questions running on Slack, but uh, so I'll jump we, on Slack then. Yes, afterwards. after afterwards, uh, I think yeah. Uh, um, so uh, I'm sorry to those who asked questions, and I, I didn't convey this now during uh, the live uh, interaction. Um, uh, but yeah, I would like to thank Guillaume for wonderful work and super interesting approach to use, using you know a powerful critic to train. Uh, <laughs> And not so powerful <laughs> generator. I wonder if that says something about uh, musical making in general, right? Maybe the musicians are not powerful and the critics are the ones who shape their <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, next presenter, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, again, I, I apologize if uh, I misspelled the name, so please correct me, uh, Yushin Zhao. And it's a paper yeah. uh, with uh, uh, also Yuki Koyamaya. Must I, well, sorry, I will not read the, the whole <laughs> list. Oh, the Japanese name. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, just, just because yeah. there are several read, uh, several authors, so uh, yeah. uh, I, I, uh, please ch check check all the I'll, authors I'll, on the I'll paper. I'll pronounce them that, that, those names. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the paper is generative mel melody composition with human in the loop Bayesian optimization. So, uh, Eugene, please. Uh, yeah, welcome. Yeah. So I'll this, share this my screen. Okay. Um, I'm gonna present the paper. Um, and Takeo Igarashi. Um, 
So I'll start from our motivation. So humans are great at composing music for a long time. Well, nowadays, many research projects um, have tried to learn how to produce music, such as GAM, BAE. And when we sample the latent vector on the smooth latent space of those kind of generative models, even novice composers can quickly generate various meaningful melodies. However, um, novice users may face significant challenges when exploring the latent space um, to find, a, 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 I would say, a desired melody since the latent space is often unintuitive and high dimensional. So our motivation comes from it that we want to investigate how humans would steer the deep generative models to find their desired melodies. Um, so in the following, I would like to introduce some related works um, in a short. And um, so I'll start from the tools I will start from the music VAE. I, I, it's a generative mel melody model, has a smooth Latin space, and we use this as our back end uh, generative model. And uh, we've seen many applications powered by the music VAE and Magenta JS. Well, our, our systems um, shares a similar motivation to, um, to out utilize the power of the deep generative model, but we focus on investigating the approach of formulating the task as a human in the loop optimization. Um, so for the next, I will introduce the Bayesian optimization and human in the loop Bayesian optimization. Well, uh, I'll call it, call it a BO for the abbreviation. So BO um, is a black box global optimization algorithm. It finds um, the optima using a small number of samplings. It chooses the next sampling point by maximizing the expected improvement. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, if you like it, please uh, find the Shahir, Shahiri's work. And uh, I will introduce the human in the loop BO. Well, it is an uh, extension of the standard Bayesian optimization. It is designed for the human in the loop sightings. And it can be, it can handle perceptual objective functions. And uh, here is another image of this kind of process. Um, BO, BO iteratively suggests candidates to the user based on their preference. If you are, you can see that this works by the koyama -san. And um, well, these projects are, are using the human in the loop Bayesian optimization. We share the same motivation, but um, our method is different because we, we iteratively ask the user to compare multiple melody candidates sampled from a one dimensional subspace and select their preferred one. And um, yeah, so in the following, I will introduce our system design. So our system is a web-based application. The front end is implemented with the React uh, kind of JavaScript and the back end is managed by a Flask server and all the music code data we, 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 we process on the MIDI level. And uh, here is a demo video. Let me show it. Because from... I, I think you're not sharing the sound. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll try to try again. I check the share the computer sound and um, let's see whether it will work. Each row represents a key on the piano from C3 to B5. 
The user can in no looking and dragging on the note sheet. Can you hear it? Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Drag a note up and down to change its pitch. Click the play button. The user can play the notes to check whether they are satisfied with them. Right click a note to delete it. The user can add two more blank bars by clicking the add button. Delete them by clicking the delete button. When they are hindered by lack of ideas, they can start searching. Choose two bars and open the searching interface. In the first iteration, candidates are randomly and uniformly sampled on the dimension reduced latent space of the pre-trained generating model. The two bars the user selected are shown in the editing region. We suppose the user prefer the melody in the editing region to the candidates. The user can play a candidate to hear how it sounds. If the user likes a candidate, they can click it to select it. The user can always go back to the initial state of the current iteration. Or go on the next so iteration. This kind of iteration goes on and on till the users find their favorite melody. And I will go on to um, share, uh, go on with the algorithms and the implementations. So our implementation used the pre-trained music VAE melody for music generation. Well, it's Latin space uh, is 512 dimension and uh, its main structure contained an encoder and a decoder. We, we, we use this to encode the MIDI level of melody to Latin space and decode the Latin vector to MIDI. Um, how, however, I would say, um, 512 is too large for Bayesian optimization to work effectively. And uh, we, have we have to choose to dimension reduce it. So we, we tested several techniques for this purpose, including the principal component analysis, autoencoders, variational in, uh, autoencoders. But we found that uh, variational autoencoders of VAE works well in terms of minimizing the reconstruction errors and generate uh, convincing and various melodies. So in this work, we use a smaller VAE, it's very small, to do the dimension, dimension reduction work. And um, another work called MIDI-ME also used this kind of um, techniques for the dimension reduction. And um, yeah, so for the training, uh, we, we would say that uh, four dimension is definitely not to encode, I mean, the, the, the original music VAE music data set. So um, we choose a small subset. We choose uh, 10 songs uh, covering the pop rock, country, and R&B, and split them into 200, uh, around 300 two-bar melody fragments to, to train this smaller model. And I'll show our problem formulation. So in the formula one, uh, function F represents the user's subjective preference over the melody, or how good the melody is. C, would be the Latin representation of the melody. The asterisk is the Latin vector that generates the most satisfying, satisfying melody to the user. And so the target optimization target here is to find Z that maximize the, the, the F function F, subjective function. And oh note, we, we do not know the landscape of F, which is the challenge of this problem. The goal here is to solve this optimization problem by iteratively presenting candidate solutions to the user and asking them to choose preferred ones. So 
you can see in the formula two, we would say the, uh, on the left hand, the after the editing, the melody X is preferred over those can those melodies on the um, right hand. Um, I'll show the algorithm uh, evaluation. We had a simulation experiment. We tried to simulate it, uh, the, the user's behavior. So the goal is to verify whether our, our algorithm can find the desired melody in a reasonable number of iterations. We used the SDTW for the metric. It, it will calculate the similarity between two melodies. Is, uh, well, the, the procedures uh, are as follows. So first we generated a uh, desired melody by random sampling on the Latin space. So um, when it's in the, at the iteration T, it will give a set of candidate melodies. We will choose the melody with the smallest SDTW to the desired melody uh, as the as the preferred one. And then we will go, it will generate another set of the um, melody for the next iteration. So uh, we iterated this procedure for 50 times and performed 100 trails. And this is the result. Um, you can find that um, the SDTW value decreased as the iterations go, went down. Uh, which was our expectation. And you can also see that uh, in the in the Latin space, the Euclidean distance between um, uh, it is also decreased. I, I would say this means, uh, I would say this means that uh, it can be indicate the smoothness of the Latin space. Uh, I would say the pre-trained music VEE Latin space is smooth. I, I would say this would prove that our smaller BAE has a smooth Latin space. And we also conducted a pilot study. We recruited two participants. They are novice, they, they never composed before. They had no formal composition training before. And um, they were asked to compose a different task. The A is asked to compose a 32 bar melody. B is a 16 bar melody. Uh, a used two and a half hours, B used one and a half hours, and A used the search that, that function to search the melody eight times, B uses six times, and they have some comments. Uh, if I summarize it, uh, I will say uh, they, they expressed that the system had effectively provided, provided them more ideas than they had, which inspired their creativity. I would say they did not, sometimes they did not use the generated melody directly. They, they, they found some, something good and they, they added it to their um, preferred one, I would say. And both participants also mentioned and that uh, the system made the process of the composition easier. Here's the result. I will only show the participant, the second one, because of the time limitation. If you like it, if you want to check, you can go to the website. There is a lag between the video and just the audio, but uh, anyway. So um, right now uh, we are waiting for the resources approved by the institute. So we will make this web application um, uh, and the code publicly in this month. And um, let's come to the conclusion. Um, our methods could uh, work uh, effectively and efficiently on searching for the user's desired melody from the latent 
metadata space. And um, the, we also showed that busy optimization could suggest satisfying candidates within a reasonable number of iterations. The pilot study result um, suggested that it also inspired the user's creativity and lower the learning barriers of the novice composers. And for the future work, uh, as also suggested by the reviewers, we would like to try to apply the Bayesian optimization to a higher dimensionality. We want to find a way um, to a higher dimensionality, like 512, eff effectively and efficiently in a, I mean, like in a kind of this kind of interactive system. And we also want to provide more control in terms of the searching behavior, like we want the user, maybe the user wants to see something more, I would say, amb ambitious, or I would say more, more different from what they input or something like that. We want those kind of um, control for the users. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for the listening. So I think we can go to the question and answer round. Yes, uh, so <clears throat> Eugene, thank you so much uh, for the yeah. uh, fascinating presentation and, and the system description. Um, so one of the questions on Slack uh, by Odette Bruntal uh, was um, about the uh, musical ex expertise of the two participants. Can, do you yeah. know, I mean, we, what was yeah. the expertise? Yeah, we, we recruited this, this participants according to the uh, criteria that they never composed music before and also they uh, but the two participants learned musical instruments in their early uh, at their earlier age like around eight or six or eight for one year piano and the other one is i remember is flute flute so basically i would say they have musical background uh, better than those people without music instruments training, but they had no training or knowledge for the composition. They just, uh, yeah. So we want to, because our folk target user is the novice composer. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I see. I, I have a question. Uh, when you show the table of how, how long they engaged that was a couple of hours. I mean, this is the time it took yeah. them to, to select the melody or these multiple iterations? They worked two hours on, on one melody selection or? The whole, um, the whole composition. Uh, so I, I just wasn't sure. When you, when you mentioned that they, uh, I think one of the users worked for two and a half hours. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what it's like. Was it the time it took them to compose one melody or during that is just their engagement with the system so they compose multiple melodies during that time i mean how long it took them to compose select a melody like like search for one time how long it would take yes yes per melody ah uh, yeah we required them to if they want to search we require them to go at least 20 iterations i see yeah so it it would uh, took a lot of time but i re uh, from my uh, uh, memory it would take five to ten minutes depending on the user the participant whether they want to add it the the the, the generated one if they don't want to keep on clicking on the next iteration it's much faster but sometimes they find they got some ideas from it and then they, mm -hmm. they edit it so that would be a, a little bit longer sometimes. And, and do, do you plan to extend this to uh, also uh, polyphony or uh, homophony, chords and melody? I mean... yeah, yes, yes, we, we this is still a working. Uh, no, for, for, for this, I mean, for this uh, process, I mean, for this stage, it's, 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 it, is, it is a complete uh, research project, but it is uh, mm -hmm. ongoing project, we are implementing more uh, control and more dynamics and including the chord because like right now we compress the octaves, I mean the pitch note ranges into three uh, octaves because we want to focusing on the main melody of a song or something. So we are trying to adding more the chord and 
even more instruments. So yeah, it's still we are still working on it. Okay. Yeah. But do you think this approach could work with, uh, you know, uh, richer latent space? Uh, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting <laughs> and it would be a very hard work. So uh, we'll see. Maybe we will find some, yeah, some, some methods to treat with this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um... So uh, okay. I would like to thank our presenter. And oh, thank, thank you. you. And uh, again, on the Slack channel, if you want to keep the discussion, please, uh, please sure. do. Um, so we'll move on to our last presentation for this session. Um, and uh, um, this is uh, um, kind of quickly, yes. So. Uh, John, you're with us. So uh, the next paper is presented by uh, Joan Ching. And I, I will let you also introduce the co-authors. Uh, and the title is Instrument Role Classification Auto-Tagging for Loop-Based Music. So please, Joan. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Dutna, for the introduction. And I will share my screen. Um, Okay, so um, the, the project I'm going to present today is the loop roll classification, which is about um, all the tagging for loop-based music. And thank you to uh, Antonio and Dr. Yang for assisting me throughout this um, project. So, um, in recent days, uh, methods for assisting electronic music production have been emerging rapidly and various creation interfaces such as um, Logic Pro, Ableton Live, Avid Pro Tools, and GarageBand and BandLab are all softwares that people can use to create music even at home. And especially the last two, which are free softwares, it's making music production uh, even, even more accessible for people. So one specific way, uh, one <laughs> specific style in electronic music production is to work with loops, which is one easy and engaging way. And since there are multiple public loops from the softwares, uh, you get to create music even without the knowledge of music theory or any technical skills. And it's basically like playing with blocks. So you can just stack the ones that you like together. And for example, looking at the picture here, um, each block A, B, and C are representing um, different loops. So imagine this is a loop-based music that I just made. Um, so what I can do is move the blocks around, like say if I'm not satisfied with this current version, I can probably take some A blocks out or um, maybe take a, the last B block out or say fill up the C blocks. And you can just move the blocks around until you've come to a uh, satisfied version and then you are done. So it's pretty, easy and simple. And so as we are doing an auto tagging task, um, so auto tagging uh, usually refers to automatically assigning semantic labels such as genre mood and instrument to music to facilitate text based music retrieval. And besides genre, mood, and instrument, we present a way that's rarely been done before, which is to do auto tagging by an audio clips role. And why do we do it this way? Well, the point is, um, especially for, ele for electronic music making, um, we think that roles might be um, more useful than maybe the instrument that were used. So therefore having the tags of audio clips role 
uh, is an important information that can perhaps ease the searching process of finding compatible loops. Um, so for those who are not um, familiar with what loops are, um, loops are audio excerpts, usually of short duration, that can be played repeatedly in a seamless manner. And compared to audio recordings of longer phrases, for example, pop music or even longer phrases, classical music, um, the motive of a loop is relatively simple and straightforward, um, which the lengths are usually of between one to four bars. And therefore, we can summarize the loops in within seconds. And here are some audio examples. Uh, here is an example, is a example of a loop-based music. So um, let me choose. Okay. So uh, what you're going to hear is um, at the first few seconds, you will hear two loops stacked together and uh, they will play the same thing over and over and over again. And then as time goes on, more and more loops will be stacked together. So um, you might know what I'm talking as soon as I play it. So. I think you didn't share sound. Is sorry. it not playing? Okay, sorry. We, we cannot hear it, yeah. Okay. Wait. Oh, let me try it. Um. Oops, sorry, too loud. <laughs> Is it playing? Can you hear the yeah. sound now? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, oh, oops. <laughs> So hopefully uh, you get what a loop-based music sounds like. Okay, so um, as we were saying, um, we do auto tagging by roles, then what exactly are roles? And this might be the most um, confusing term in this task. Um, so instruments don't always link to the same role. So you can think it this way, uh, in a recording of, say, a band playing, uh, like this picture over here, um, each track in the recording plays their own role. Like one may be playing the melodic part and the other one might be playing the percussive part. So what matters is the audio content and it, and it depends um, on what this instrument is doing in the audio. So for example, the synth pads over here, it can be linked to either effects or a melody, um, but you have to hear what the, what the content in this loop is to determine whether it's a effect or a melody. So um, it can be played by a synthesizer, but um, what I mean is you have to listen to it to know the rules. Uh, so here are some uh, examples for what it sounds like for each role. Okay. Mm. So the first one is pretty uh, obvious and it's it's a percuss. Uh, it's a drum drum loop, and it's linked to uh, the percussion roll. So, and 
and you can hear that it's basically uh, repeating the same thing over and over again, uh, which makes sense that it's a loop. And the next two, um, it might be a little bit, uh, no. The next two are all, play, are all played by uh, synthesizers, um, but one is linked to effects and one is linked to melody. So they are played, they are played by the same instrument, but they have diff they are playing different different roles here. <laughs> So I hope you get what I'm trying to say here. And so uh, in order to do this task, uh, we, we build a prototype that's based on a convolutional neural network that uses a data-driven harmonic filter-based front end, uh, which is called the HCNN. And it was derived from the, the work of data-driven harmonic filters for audio representation learning, which is cited down here. And so because of the harmonic filters, the model is able to capture local, spectral, and temporal relation. And in addition, the model is mentioned for its efficiency of learning. So for example, since our data set is so small, uh, with only 2,936 loops. We expect the model to be able to catch uh, important features for classifying. And now to show the effectiveness and accuracy, we used both neural network-based methods and non-neural network-based methods. For a neural network-based method, uh, it is basically an ablated version of the HCNN, which uses the same network structure, but just without the harmonic filters. And for the non-neural network based methods, um, the most common functions used for multi-label classification problems are binary relevance, label power set, and distinct random K label sets. And we will refer to them as BR, LP, and, Rec and RACL, respectively. So looking at the results, um, the accuracy difference between non-harmonic CNN and HCNN showed efficacy of using the harmonic filters. And also it's visible that uh, due to the majority of loops being single labeled, um, the predicted answers appear to be trending towards giving only one label. So as you can see in figure, figure C and figure D over here, um, they, are, they have uh, multiple labels, but the, res um, but the predicted results there's only one label being the peak. So yeah, and, and also um, another error case that might appear is for um, the voice, voice loops. Um, because voice loops is the least appeared label. Um, so voice was categorized as either um, percussion or effects instead of itself. So, however, it is within a reasonable range because um, voice loops are usually either singing or beatboxing. So linking them to melody effects or percussion is still reasonable. And so, for our future work, we might want to 
um, Auckland, the amount of lesser peer loops, like what was just said, the voice loops um, for a more balanced data set. And we are also interested in using, we are also interested in using the loop role classifier as building block for automatic meshup or loop-based music creation. So perhaps a downstream application for a more referenced automatic meshup would probably be an interesting implementation. And thank you for your attention. And I guess we can go to the question, uh, question and answer. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, John. Let me uh, quickly check what we have on the Slack channel. Um, so, uh, um, I think one one of the questions uh, that you know, the, it seems that your work combines a lot of aspects, both of creating timbers by combining them together, right? So you you need to know which functions each clip has with the annotation. Uh, but then each clip has its own uh, temporal behavior. So it seems like you know you try to to uh, address very many different aspects of, of basically that composing of loops, which means uh, how do you, what is your preference for the indi individual loop? Like we had in the previous papers and questions about quality of melody or quality of a drum loop, and then uh, you also try to put them all together. So it's like uh, you asking questions about orchestration. So it's almost like your system has to answer all the questions that the previous papers were pointing to, right? Quality of the melody, quality of the drum loop, quality of the orchestral thing. Uh, do you think you know the annotation itself? Um, captures all of these aspects in some way? Um, well, actually, um, it's doing quite a good job of mm -hmm. our um, targeted, um, for our targets. Um, um, well, yeah, it's, it's a, um, probably a difficult uh, task for machines to do this, but like in the loops, because different instruments are mixed together and there might even be, there's probably multiple instruments in one loop. So, um, but basically in the data set, um, a single loop only has one, how do I say this? <laughs> a single loop only has one uh, targeted role. So there's usually no um, uh, well, at least I haven't ran into this, but um, I haven't heard like loops having both percussion and both, uh, for example, both percussion and melody together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it might be a complicated work for machines, but um, at least at this point, um, it seems like it's doing quite a good job. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if I um, answered mm -hmm. your question. <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, yeah, I, I think you did. I was just <laughs> wondering if, uh, if you had experience with people, uh, you know, using this, this system that uh, it actually addresses all different aspects of music when they um, apply a method. But, um, yeah. Yeah. But thank, thank I you think so much. I think one mm -hmm. one of the point for doing this task for doing auto tagging in this way is also to um, instead of a specific label or like a specific tag, um, we're kind of like pulling it back a little bit. So like the um, target range is a little bit more is a little bit wider, but um, I think it's musically a little bit more uh, reasonable. Like it's not so specific, either it's wrong or it's right, but um, there's mm -hmm. a range of uh, reasonable 
reasonable answers. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Uh, this is uh, very interesting work and, and definitely has a lot of uh, practical applications for, for the DAOs, as you ind indicated. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, all right. So, um, uh, I don't have any, any, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I hope I'm not missing anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would like to thank uh, all our presenters uh, for the fascinating session. And of course, uh, thank our host, Bob Sturm. Uh, and if, if, um, I think we're kind of right on time. Uh, if anybody would like to, to join the session together or have a few, few last words or Bob would like to summarize something, uh, please do. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, I would like to, again, uh, thank everybody and, and the audience um, and hope to see you in, actually tomorrow. I think it's the last session for today, right? if I'm not mistaken. We have the keynote tonight. Right, okay, yeah. Um, Alice Eldridge. So that all starts in four hours. But thank you, yes. everybody. And thank you, Shlomo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Take care. Stay safe.